Check one, two, one, two. Hey, hey, check one, two. Is this already working? Is this working? Yes. OK, so do you hear me well? Yeah? OK. So uh, yeah, good evening. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming and, uh, to tonight's lecture with uh, Teddy Cruz and Fona Foreman. Could give you a moment to see the Teddy. <laughs> Uh, just joining us. So my name is Ray Salgueiro. I am a lecturer here at the Department of Architecture. I'm also the curator director of the MIT Morning Star Academy for Design, MIT MAT, uh, which is uh, presenting this event uh, together with the Architecture and Urbanism Group uh, in collaboration. Uh, I'm going to be introducing uh, Teddy and Forma that will be giving the lecture uh, after me. Uh, but before doing that, I would like to read, uh, as always, the land acknowledgement uh, of our department which says, MIT acknowledges indigenous peoples as the traditional stewards of the land and the enduring relationship that exists between them and their traditional territories. The land on which we sit is the traditional and ceded territory of the Wampanoag Nation. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced occupation of their territory, and we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous people connected to this land, which they gather from time immemorial. So importantly, is this like, should we closer? Yeah. Okay, better? Yes, yeah. definitely. Now I, I even hear myself better. Uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna repeat the land acknowledgement though. Uh, so importantly, questions uh, related to uh, the status of land, uh, and the relationship between land and urbanization are uh, a crucial aspect of the work of Teddy Cruz and Forna Foreman in their studio. Their projects interrogate who has access to land, how it is divided and administered, where and by whom it is governed. Their work explores how geopolitical borders are produced, how communities are affected by them, and how they can be altered and transgressed. Integral to these questions has been a continued interest in reinforcing the agency that communities have in shaping urban processes, a concern that has uh, drawn them to explore different modes to democratize and decolonize the practice of design. Studio Teddy Cruz and Fona Formand approaches these questions through a deep engagement with uh, the particular context in which they live and work, which is the uh, San Diego-Tijuana border, a context that actually they explore at both sides of the US and Mexico divide. Their decade-long uh, work in the area is multi-layered. It involves uh, research, communication, community activism, design, and building different uh, a, a programs uh, from housing to community buildings. It is a strongly uh, research-based work, but actually always oriented towards showing and implementing actions and that lead to a spatial transformations. You know? In this sense, uh, their practice engages with and extends a tradition of socially responsible and transformative architecture and urbanism with references to things as the CIM battle plan of La Sagasse, of uh, Jean Prouvé's construction systems, of uh, Henri Lefebvre's notion of right to the city, of situ situationism, Italian radical architecture, and so on. This effort to construct a mode of practice that triggers both discussion and the spatial transformation offers and uses multiple, multiple modes of architectural action and design 
from exhibitions to the actual practice of, of building. Uh, while Studio Teddy Cruz, oops. oh my goodness. is that I still have to speak for two minutes. So while Studio Teddy Cruz and Fona Forman practice uh, represents an exemplary mode of actually engaging with a very uh, uh, particular context and showing their social, economical, political, and spatial complexities, the studio works also like has been exploring how these conditions are actually part of a broader a problematization of planetary challenges, going from migration to global inequality and justice to, of course, like the effects of anthropogenic climate change. For instance, their intervention in the 2019 Venice Architecture Biennale was an exploration of the whole US-Mexican border. And in other occasions, their research has also revealed the many lines and frontiers dividing Earth, the deep fractures between the global south and the global north, and how transborder urban spaces are actually crucial spaces to actually understand the, the, the spatial dynamics that are affecting us, and also as crucial spaces to give them a response. Uh, this form of practice benefits from the very uh, distinctive and, and, and crucial like disciplinary profiles of uh, the uh, Terry and Fona. Fona is a professor of political theory at the University of California, San Diego where she founded and directs the Center on Global Justice. An expert on economist Adam Smith, she has been recently working on a variety of projects dealing with the massive impacts of climate change on vulnerable populations. In 2021, she was appointed by the University of California's president to be the co-chair of the UC Global Climate Leadership Council, which advises on climate and sustainability policy, research, and education. And between 2014 and 2018, she was appointed by British Prime Minister Gordon Brown to serve on the Global Citizenship Commission, advising UN policy on human rights on the 21st century. Teddy, in turn, is an architect, uh, a professor of public culture and spatial practices in the Department of Visual Arts at the University of California, San Diego, and also the co-director with FONA of the Center on Global Justice. He has been the recipient of the Rome Prize in Architecture, the Ford Foundation Visionaries Award, the Architecture Award from the US Academy of Arts and, Sci and, Let and Letters, the uh, Global Award for Sustainable Architecture by the French National Museum of Architecture in partnership with UNESCO, and the BSEC Prize in Architecture. Their work together has been uh, uh, profiled in multiple media, uh, from the New York Times to Domus to Art Forum. It has been exhibited across the world in spaces as the Venice Biennale that I just uh, mentioned, on the Art Museum of San Francisco, on the Cooper Hewitt Museum of Design, and also in the Museum of Modern Art. And actually their work is there a part of their permanent collection. Last year, uh, they published uh, two books uh, that I have here, Specializing Justice and Socializing Architecture uh, with MIT Press. Uh, the books are actually also like, behind uh, their invitation to come here. And I have to thank uh, MIT Press uh, because they are offering the books at discount at the MIT bookstore, uh, both this week and the next one. So please, uh, you know what to do after the talk uh, in the coming days. Um, the lecture is going to be moderated by Angelo Bucci, uh, a professor here uh, of uh, practice and the founder of SPBR, you know, an, an office in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And finally, just to conclude, I would like to thank uh, the Department of Architecture, to Jolan Daniels and the other members of the committee on lectures and events. And also thanks yeah, to Joel Carella, to the team in, of the communications of the MIT Department of Architecture, and to my colleagues at the MIT Morning Side Academy for Design, Marion Cunningham and Adelaide Solinger, for their work in uh, making like, this event possible and also in making it visible for a variety of audiences. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Fona and Teddy, for coming. And please uh, join me in welcoming them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was such a nice introduction. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Roy. That was a beautiful, um, that was a beautiful introduction. Can that, you know, can you all hear us? OK, wonderful. So we're delighted. We're delighted to be here. Um, we're grateful to the Department of Architecture, to the Morningside Academy that not only made uh, our visit possible, but also helped provide a publication subvention that made our books possible. <laughs> um, so we're, we're, we're just delighted um, to be here at MIT uh, again. Um, so we're going to tag team. Um, we'll go back and forth. Um, in our research-based practice in San Diego, Tijuana, we really see this region as a microcosm of all of the injustices and indignities faced by vulnerable people across the planet. Political violence, climate disruption, accelerating migration, rising nationalism, border building everywhere, deepening inequality, and the steady decay of public thinking. We live and work a few miles away from the child detention centers that will forever stain this period of American history. San Diego, Tijuana is a lightning rod of American nativism. In recent years, tens of thousands of Mexican Central American and Haitian migrants waited at the wall for asylum that often never came, often reviled by publics on both sides as a nuisance or an infestation, or else they sat in US detention centers as tools of deterrence, exposed to a global pandemic and separated forcibly from their children. It has been particularly devastating in recent years to witness the emotional impact on children. Their fear and the inevitable psychic internalization of being socially and morally marginalized. The prospect of more border porosity in the coming period, as well as ambiguous asylum policy, is now drawing even more people north. Conditions are intensifying again every day. And climate change will accelerate these flows in the years to come. A recent United Nations survey found that 72% of arriving migrants at our southern border are agricultural workers, and that agricultural instability was a major factor in their decision to walk north. Everyone tends to see northward migration in this part of the world as a function of poverty and violence. And of course, this is true. But climate change is a threat multiplier, right? It makes poverty and food insecurity worse. It aggravates violence and ultimately compounds the reason why people are willing to take the risk, leave their homes, and walk north. But international agencies do not see these people as refugees. They see them instead as economic migrants who are drawn toward a better life, right? There's no such legal term yet as a climate refugee. So these people are not entitled to asylum or international refugee protection under the Geneva Convention. This, is going to, this will need to change right, in an era of accelerating climate migration. Now, border communities and activists on both sides of the wall confront these injustices and indignities every day challenging policies and practices that criminalize migrants. Over the years, Teddy and I have accompanied a lot of this bottom-up activity in close partnership with agencies at the front lines. These struggles also regularly attract artists and cultural producers from around the world to engage in gestures of performative protest. We literally get calls every month from well-intended artists and creatives eager to engage the border, asking us to kind of facilitate their enthusiasm. But we've become increasingly critical of ephemeral action that sort of dips in and out of the conflict, extracts cultural attention, and then disappears without any sense of responsibility to what happens the day after the happening, right? Um, so we, over the years, have been advocating for a longer view of resistance 
and participatory strategic thinking about cultural, institutional, and spatial transformation in the border region. To do this, we've designed a system that connects our design lab at the University of California, San Diego, UCSD, where we teach, with conditions in the field. And we've built a network of spaces on both sides of the wall called the UCSD Community Stations that we'd like to introduce you to. Think of them as a distributed university where we partner with low-income communities on both sides of the border on long-term projects. Here, universities and communities meet to share knowledges and resources and to collaborate on research, dialogue, cultural and educational activities, advocacy, migrant housing, and environmental infrastructure. Several core commitments that we call building blocks ground this work. You might think of them as a sort of ethical and social foundations of the very practical work that we're doing uh, in this region. As we move through our talk, you'll encounter a series of yellow pages that are drawn from the, two, uh, the new two-volume monograph uh, recently published with MIT. And again, this is a wonderful opportunity to thank the press, Victoria Hindley, our editor, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight, as well as Morningside Academy, um, and New York-based artist David Deutsch uh, and his Park Foundation, who were really instrumental in uh, bringing these books to light. So I'm going to introduce several of the building blocks. Teddy will take you on a, a very brief tour of the UCSD Community Station sites, and then I'll come back and conclude with a few words about how our very local work connects with conflict zones across the world. So we radicalize the local. We've always resisted the idea that global justice is something that happens far away out there in the world somewhere, living and working where we do, we don't need to send our students far away to engage territorial conflict, migration, poverty, climate catastrophe. We are minutes away from an international border in crisis. And this enables an amazing proximity between studio and field, between theory and practice, what we think of as a critical proximity. Of course, going local here means recognizing ourselves as a region, a site of interdependence and cooperation. Despite the wall and the ugly political rhetoric designed to divide us, we are a binational ecology of flows and circulation, and our future here is intertwined. Air, water, waste, health, culture, money, hope, justice, these things don't stop at walls. Border zones are unrelentingly porous things, and these flows shape the transgressive hybrid identities and everyday practices in this part of the world. We are committed to decolonizing knowledge. We're keenly attuned to power dynamics when universities arrive in communities and are critical of both extractive research methods and humanitarian problem-solving missions. We don't do applied research, and we don't do charity. Academic culture, design culture, is often filled with vertical assumptions, right? That we know more, that we are trained to solve the world's problems if only they would listen to us. We are committed instead to horizontal practices of co-production, engaging communities as partners with knowledge and agency. Everybody contributes. Everybody learns, and we do things together in the border region that nobody could possibly do alone. Institutions with power too often take for granted the resources that communities invest when they partner with us. You know, time, space, social capital, labor, knowledge. As a matter of epistemic justice and labor equity, these contributions need to be validated and they need to be compensated, right? So we're building long-term trust bridges, long-term partnerships between our research university and border communities. We're there for the long haul. We don't disappear because a grant dries up or a, a course ends. Relatedly, 
We're committed to learning from the bottom up, not just being there, but learning. We condemn the economic forces that marginalize people into slums, but we're continually inspired by ingenious practices of resilience, by communities confronting marginalization, scarcity, and danger. Too often these places, as we all know, are sidelined by planners and policymakers as ugly, criminal, neglected, to be avoided, to be cleaned up, to be cleared. But our orientation is very different. We observe intensely active, creative urban agents who challenge the dominant paradigms of growth that exclude them, who demonstrate other, more inclusive, more sustainable ways of inhabiting the city. We believe university researchers and designers can help channel this bottom-up knowledge upward to support more intelligent, responsive policy making and allocation of resources. Ultimately, we're engaged here in what we see as a cultural project, right? building a cross-border citizenship culture in the San Diego Tijuana region, a sense of belonging that is defined not by the nation state or the documents that you carry in your pocket, but by the shared interests and aspirations among people who inhabit a violently disrupted civic space. We reject ideas of citizenship that fragment and divide and seek to inspire more inclusive imaginaries of belonging and coexistence in this contested territory. Border regions are a natural laboratory for reimagining citizenship along these lines. And public space is an important part of this cultural agenda. For us, public space is a public good that should be activated for civic dialogue and infused with resources to increase public knowledge and capacity for political and environmental action. We reject conventional strategies of urban beautification and redevelopment that turn our, you know, our public spaces into enclaves of consumption that typically benefit private developers more than anyone else. We see public space as a site of urban pedagogy. We also see public space as an armature for reorganizing social housing. And we'd like to linger here for a moment that housing needs to be conceptualized beyond units. In conditions of poverty, housing needs to be embedded in an infrastructure of social, economic, and cultural support. We need to rethink affordable housing from autonomous units into relational social systems. And you'll see in a moment how this works in our own projects. We all, by, you know, we all know by now the demolition of pruitt Igo in St. Louis marked the death of public housing in the United States, cementing in people's minds the equation that public housing equals ghetto equals crime, and that modern architecture is fundamentally dehumanizing. The campaign to demonize public housing was extremely effective. And by the mid-1980s, the, you know, the responsibility for producing affordable public housing had shifted decisively from the public to the private, entrusting the private sector and the market with the freedom to determine its own product, set the terms of affordability, and ultimately elevate style and now form-based code at the expense of housing rights. But Prudigo's decline demands critical re-examination, as we will show you in our work. When Prudigo was built, its housing units thrived. They were equipped with social services and economic support, sustained by progressive taxation and public policy. When these support systems were defunded and the unit's inhabitants were abandoned, the project imploded. Since then, the housing agenda has morphed from hyper-public to hyper-private, from housing to houses, from social systems to isolated units. And this all accelerated the atomization of habitation, unsustainable sprawl, 
and social fragmentation. And what's come of this? After decades of public retreat, thousands of public units, public housing units have been demolished. Millions of people have been foreclosed. Millions more risked eviction during the pandemic and houselessness has exploded. A new, so new social economy of housing is more urgent than ever. So we engage the housing crisis today with a critique of public withdrawal and trickle down market logics. The market will never guarantee housing as a public good. We'll never guarantee community participation and inclusion and we'll never fight off gentrification. We question housing financialization models that prioritize private interests. Only the public can demand public priorities. We need transparent progressive governance, collaborating with civil society to integrate design, funding, service provision, social safety, and legal protections through which architects can again right, serve public priorities and ask more creative questions about urban development. Questions like, are there other strategies and scales of affordable housing that can incrementally penetrate the hegemony of market-based sprawl? Can community-based agencies, for example, become alternative developers of housing for their own neighborhoods? Can new alliances be forged between municipalities and grassroots and the grassroots to co-develop municipal parcels? Can institutions, public institutions, direct their purchasing power toward communities to promote local productivity and create jobs? Can philanthropic foundations become alternative below market lenders? Can architects and communities collaborate to produce new economic models for small scale urban development? And where can these new sites of experimentation happen to test and scale new approaches to housing? So all, all these questions have provoked our work at the San Diego-Tijuana border, where neighborhoods on both sides of the wall have become laboratories for inclusive social housing, where public sp space becomes a seed for community development. On the San Diego side, we engage older suburban zones where migrants have settled for generations and where sprawl, commodification, and creeping gentrification fragment communities and exacerbate consumption and waste. Here we seek to informalize the formal just enough to maximize social density, small scale economic vitality and climate adaptation. In other words, injecting complexity into highly homogenized unsustainable environments. And on the Tijuana side, we engage informal settlements where bottom up urban dynamics generate adaptive uses and special mixing, but lack resources to stabilize, scale up, and pe perform to their full capacity. Here, we seek to formalize the informal just enough to maximize local capabilities. In other words, injecting frameworks to organize and stabilize urban heterogeneity. Through this research, we decided long ago that tackling the housing crisis cannot wait for the client and the brief. We co-produce the brief with communities, understood not as clients, but as co-developers. And together, we summon the bottom-up energies and top-down uh, institutions that are needed to realize a project in the absence of formal public support. All of our projects leverage the capacities of our public university. In essence, we have conceptualized a new financial proforma for community-owned housing, co-developed between university and community. To carry out this work, we advanced our UCSD community stations that was, were mentioned earlier as a model of urban co-development between a public university and community organizations. We have designed a network of public spaces on both sides of the wall and have built spaces of dignity and sanctuary in the city's periphery. Each community station is designed, funded, built, programmed, and maintained collaboratively between the campus and the community. Effectively, 
we have mobilized the economic and programmatic power of our public university, UC San Diego, to become leverage for our partners to develop their own housing and public spaces. For us then, urban justice is a redistributive concept. We are redistributing resources, but we are also redistributing knowledges. As a distributed system of public spaces transgressing the wall, the community stations specialize social justice. Uh, we have uh, built four community stations in total, two in San Diego, two in Tijuana. We will share two that focus on migrant housing and public space on both sides of the border. So let's start on our campus and move north to south. The UCSD Casa Community Station is a partnership with Casa Familiar, a 30-year-old community-based organization. It is located in the border neighborhood of San Isidro, site of the busiest land crossing in the Western Hemisphere, and site of the worst air quality in San Diego County. We have written much about our research here on the positive impact of immigrants in the transformation of American neighborhoods. Here, Tijuana's non-conforming mixed uses migrate north, and these pixels of difference transform the large homogeneous swaths of exclusionary land uses of San Diego's sprawl into more sustainable and plural environments. And when this uh, confetti, this Tijuana, Tijuana's confetti of non-conforming land uses hits the ground in San Diego, it alters existing mono-use parcels across inner city neighborhoods, pixelating them with social, economic, and cultural complexity. San Diego's cookie-cutter subdivisions, in other words, are retrofitted by immigrant communities, like this mid-city post-war bungalow that was transformed into a Buddhist temple by a Vietnamese community. So who would imagine that the post-war American dream enshrined in the detached single-family suburban dwelling would be adapted over time by the entrepreneurial energies of immigrants? Who would in, uh, um, these are urbanizations of adaptation, where bottom-up urban pra practices can inspire a new political economy to support alternative social densities, transitional uses, and shared economies found within immigrant neighborhoods. The UCSD Casa Community Station began with the adaptive reuse of a beloved historic church that sat for decades in disrepair and which we were able to rescue through this project. During construction, the building had to be lifted to install new foundations. During times of so much political violence inflicted uh, on this border community, the surreal image of the levitating church inspired a sense of hope for local residents. With this renovation, we initiated a process to transform the small parcels surrounding it into infrastructures for social, economic, and cultural activity, reorganizing the lots into linear public systems to strengthen and expand an existing network of old alleys that are used by residents as informal pedestrian corridors. So this, this neighborhood-based framework hybridizes public space and housing. A parcel size social infrastructure, our community station, for cultural and economic activity is framed by affordable housing. Organizing the parcel through a system of linear strips with a variety of small-scale buildings performing different roles was a deliberate strategy to coordinate diverse financial streams to fund the different building typologies, synergizing university, community, and foundation economic resources. Our community partner has essentially become now an alternative developer of affordable housing for its own community, and public space was the detonator. We renovated the church into a community theater with an outdoor stage flanked on one side by a series of small accessory buildings for social programming, and on the other side by an open-air civic pavilion. This social infrastructure anchors 10 units of affordable housing, a sixplex and a fourplex at both ends of the parcel, all mediated by pedestrian walkways. We completed construction in 2020. 
The church has become an epicenter of cultural life for the neighborhood, with its interior transformed into a small black box performance space that spills into the courtyards. And the social pavilions have been activated with migrant and community support programs. During the pandemic, the social spaces provided opportunities uh, for open air gatherings. We are now fully engaged in cultural programming with our partners. In fact, our programming focuses on cultural processes that expose injustice and increase neighborhood capacity. Imagine a small coalition of local artists, promotoras, and neighborhood youth collaborating with university curators, theater script writers, and visual artists who co-produce a play or a musical performance that explores an urgent issue facing the community and enacted by local residents in the community theater or civic pavilions. These cultural productions are rooted in neighborhood stories and become bottom-up evidence to increase public knowledge and transform policy. What we are trying to say here in essence really is that affordable housing takes on, I should say social housing, <laughs> takes on a different meaning when it is threaded into spaces for social programming, when residents participate in local economy and cultural productivity. Here, affordable housing is not just a number of cheap units, but an integrated social spatial system that is programmed by university and community synergizing spaces, programs, resources, and people. Before moving across the border, let me pause for a moment to emphasize several building blocks that have organized our thinking uh, for this particular station. Urban justice, demands structural transformations in public and urban policy. We need a new political language to complicate what we mean by density, zoning, and property. Cliches like equity, walkability, affordability, livability are meaningless without the requisite changes in policy and economy. Redefining affordability means amplifying the value of community participation. More than owning units, residents and community-based agencies can also co-own and co-manage the economic and social infrastructure around them. Informal markets within communities can seed new models of financing that support unconventional mixed uses. In other words, we must reassign value to skills and capabilities found in communities and create new roles for other civic actors in the development process. Density should be measured, should not be measured as an abstract number of objects or people per area. Density must be understood as the intensity of social and economic exchanges per area. Immigrant neighborhoods have taught us that bottom-up urbanization is the DNA for democratizing the city. We challenge zoning that facilitates this investment, in fact, perpetuates inequality and disconnects affordable housing from civic infrastructure and public space. Zoning must stop being punitive. Instead, it should be conceptualized as a generative tool that anticipates, stimulates, and organizes social and economic activity in neighborhoods. We have become developers, and this, this provocation is the one that the developers performer is architecture's financial, fin, uh, financial plastic. Inside the mathematics of this spreadsheet, our services as architects amount to 15% of a project's construction costs. This undercapitalized asset can be mobilized as collateral for development. Nothing should prevent us architects from becoming alternative developers of housing, and nothing should prevent communities from doing the same. In other words, we can bundle the sweat equity of architects, cultural producers, and community leaders, the economic equity of public universities, and municipal protocols for accessing public parcels to enable communities to develop their own neighborhoods. This truly has been our story. In the end, the American dream of property ownership becomes irrational in conditions of dramatic structural inequality. 
we need to rethink conditions of ownership and recuperate crea creative tools for community-based development in low-income neighborhoods, like United Housing Federations, community land trusts, to safeguard long-term affordability and prevent social displa displacements produced by market fluctuation. Moving now across the border, our two community stations in Tijuana are located in the Laureles Canyon, an informal settlement adjacent to the border wall on the western periphery of Tijuana. I will take a few moments to uh, describe this incredible context. This site is at an important juncture of conflict. Here, the topography of Tijuana's canyons clash with the border wall before spilling northbound into an environmentally protected estuary in San Diego, now layered with security infrastructure. At this hotspot, the conflict between natural and jurisdictional systems and between ecological and political priorities is profound. And as we zoom in further, we witness a collision between the estuary and the US, the border wall, and the informality of the Laureles Canyon, which is home to 100,000 people, included th including thousands of migrants who have arrived in the last years. This aerial video shows Laureles Canyon and the precarious condition of the informal settlement that has a sprawl on, this, on the slopes. This site sits 30 minutes from our campus, 15 minutes, uh, 30 minutes from our campus, and demonstrates the dramatic proximity of wealth and extreme poverty in our region. Laureles Canyon is impacted by dump sites, drastic erosion, flooding, and landslides, and all of this is exacerbated by the dramatic precipitation fluctuations of climate change. And because Laureles Canyon lacks water and waste management infrastructure to mitigate these impacts, much of the trash, along with tons of sediment, flows northward, ending in the estuary in San Diego, contaminating this bioregional shared by national asset. In other words, here, the border wall is truly an artifact of environmental insecurity. These impacts have intensified in recent years because of the profound lack of collaboration between San Diego and Tijuana to manage these cross-border flows. In the last decades, 70% of the open lands in Laureles Canyons have been lost to irregular urban growth. We have been identifying and bundling on squatted lands in the settlement that are still environmentally rescuable to shape an archipelago of conservation. We are advancing an ambitious regional project called the Cross-Border Commons, an environmental conservation initiative that links the estuary in the US with the informal settlement in Mexico, forming a continuous social and ecological envelope that transgresses the wall and protects the environmental systems shared between these two border cities. And we have now curated a coalition of state and municipal agencies, nonprofits, and universities on both sides of the wall to adopt and protect the remaining unsquatted public lands inside this informal settlement. Another important contextual note before I introduce you to the one, one of the Tijuana stations is that Laureles Canyon is a site of informal urbanization. And as we have written about over many years, the informal settlements of Tijuana are built with urban waste from San Diego, recycling architectural parts to construct emergency housing and infrastructure. We have learned a great deal from these incremental building practices as people construct their own shelter in layers over time. In a case study we documented uh, years ago, a metal frame appeared from one day to another and in a couple of months, recycled materials began to thread the spaces and in the next weeks, an informal house emerged. We have also taken note that multinational maquiladoras surround these informal settlements to benefit from easy access to cheap labor. So over the years, we have experimented with factory-made material systems to structurally mediate the recycling of waste. We have, in fact, proposed an ethical loop where factories invest in emergency housing. Here, we are inside Mecalux, a Spanish maquiladora 
that produces lightweight metal shelving materials for global export, retrofitting its prefabricated systems into structural scaffolds for emergency housing. We designed a catalog with the factory's engineers to test a variety of prototypes and configuration. The first Mechalux typology is shown here with adapted recycled urban waste from San Diego, illustrating how top-down institutional resources can support, must support, the bottom-up creative intelligence of informal urbanization. A few years ago, we built the first study and being inside the factory, redirecting these material systems and surplus value to size of emergency was an important milestone in our research-based practice. So it was important to introduce you briefly to these contextual processes because our community stations in Tijuana operate within this rich ecology of social, environmental, economic, and material relations. Now, I will share one of these stations. The UCSD Alacran Community Station is located in the most rugged, precarious, and polluted sub-basin of the canyon in one of the islands of the conservancy we mentioned earlier. It is a partnership with Embajadores de Jesus, a religious organization led by activist pastor Gustavo Banda, who with limited resources built a refugee camp here to provide shelter, food, and basic services to hundreds of Haitian and Central American refugees while they navigated prolonged asylum processes in the US and Mexico. And with the help of skilled migrants, they began building their own emergency housing. So a few years ago, we established a long-term partnership here to co-develop a community station to increase refugee housing capacity. So we have now increased the production of the Mechalux frames uh, to install them on vernacular post and beam concrete systems into a housing infrastructure. Together, we are building Santuario Frontera, now the largest refugee sanctuary in the US-Mexico border region. The housing scaffolds were built first, and the interiors are equipped with utilities to support incremental live-war configurations. These envelopes are being infilled right now by the migrant residents themselves. The project was profiled in the New York Times last year for its unconventional economic model focused on longer-term habitation, social inclusion, ecological restoration, and, and for generating jobs. Where housing is embedded in spaces for fabrication, vocational training, and small-scale economic development, including a resident-owned construction cooperative uh, building the site. And this cooperative will remain intact for future construction and ecological restoration projects across the canyon to advance the cross-border commons. In other words, we see migrant housing as a mechanism for generating jobs and circling revenue back into the community. Santuario Frontera began construction in 2022. The migrant community assembled the Mechalux shelving systems into housing frames. And we also began healing the topography, creating hydrofiltration channels and gabions and terracing and water collection systems, demonstrating that migrant housing can, uh, can help restore uh, local habitat and become the catalyst for building a more inclusive city from below. This is a translatable model of collaboration between public university and faith-based organization and a multinational factory in Tijuana, subsidizing the materials. With so much momentum, this has become the largest, uh, again, uh, migrant shelter in the entire border region. We are now developing Santuario Frontera into a full-on sanctuary neighborhood with social services, a school, a hydroponic farm, economic incubators, a health clinic. A food hall has just been completed with a civic, um, with a civic plaza and a large industrial kitchen where our students are leading public health and food justice programming with the migrant community. So uh, following uh, the model for all the other community stations, 
once we build these uh, community spaces, we then activate them with collaborative educational and cultural research in activities. Our, co our cultural programming at these stations focuses on social protection from landslides, floods, and estuary health beyond the wall. We lead educational programming through which young people understand zones of vulnerability in their own neighborhoods, emphasizing conservation of species and habitat restoration. It's never too early to begin. We have committed to elevating children here as the cross-border citizens of the future. So migrant shelters help us rethink housing as a more integrative and inclusive ecosystem, where infrastructure can be an agile and anticipatory social spatial framework capable of negotiating both transition and rootedness, the ephemeral and the permanent. Santuario Frontera has advanced two additional building blocks for our practice. Urban informality decolonizes the meaning of infrastructure. For us, the informal is not just an aesthetic category. It is a praxis, a dynamic set of urban operations from below that counter and transgress top-down political power and exclusionary economic models. And hospitality is the first gesture when the immigrant arrives, an essential charitable opening, a first step in creating a more welcoming society. But as needs become more complex over time, charity is not the appropriate model for building an inclusive society. We need to move from hospitality, which is symbolic, to inclusion, which is operative. Thinking beyond shelter is a call for rethinking refugee camps everywhere, from places of short-term habitation and service provision to durable infrastructures for inclusion. So there's so much more to say about the community stations, about our amazing partners, and what we do in these spaces together. What we want to emphasize here in the end are the cultural strategies through which we are imagining, reimagining possible futures in a region like this and rethinking jurisdiction in a militarized border zone. We want to cultivate what we think of as an elastic civic identity here from the bottom up. And to do this, we curate unwalling experiments that dissolve the wall using visual tools like radical cartographies and performative pedagogies to situate border neighborhoods within broader spatial ecologies of circulation and interdependence from local to regional to continental and ultimately to global scales. We see this kind of elasticity as a civic skill, you know, the ability to imaginatively stretch and return between local and more expansive ways of thinking, to really understand one's own challenges within broader global and geopolitical processes and to envision opportunities for collaboration across all kinds of walls. Here in the border region where we work, the idea of the bio region, right, the binational watershed system has been a powerful imaginary for activating this more elastic kind of civic thinking. Several years ago, we curated a cross-border public action through one of the sewage drains that Homeland Security had carved underneath the wall between the estuary that Teddy introduced you to and the informal settlement of Loreles Canyon. We negotiated a permit with border control to transform this drain into an official port of entry going southbound for 24 hours. They, were they agreed they were disarmed by our self-representation as just artists as long as Mexican immigration was waiting on the other side of the border wall to stamp our passports. So our convoy was comprised of 300 local activists, representatives from the municipalities of San Diego and Tijuana, and border activists from across the world. 
We summoned agencies who are typically at odds with one, and one another. And as we moved together southbound here under the wall, we witnessed slum wastewater and plastics rushing northward beneath our feet toward the estuary. This strange crossing, you know, um, through a militarized culvert and the stamping of passports amplified the most profound conflicts and interdependencies of our border region. The great insight here was that protecting the vulnerable US estuary demands shared investment in the informal Mexican settlement. So in this cultural experiment, we went down. But sometimes nurturing this more elastic civic identity requires ascending above. So imagine a migrant child standing on a narrow sliver, uh, sliver of land, hundreds of feet above the border wall, um, right here at a place uh, called Mirador. Imagine she plants her feet facing due west with the Pacific Ocean in front of her, Mexico to her left, the US to her right. Below to her immediate left, she sees the dense informal settlement where she now lives and its proximity to a country that she and her family are not permitted to enter. Below to her immediate right, almost beneath her feet, she sees the border wall, which from this vantage looks like a flimsy and ridiculous strip inserted into a vast and powerful natural system. Lifting her eyes, she sees the green expanse of the Tijuana River estuary with its vulnerable wetland habitats encrusted with waste from her community. And further beyond still, you can't see it in this photo, downtown San Diego rising vertically into the sky. From this vantage, all of the characters of this contested zone come to life. We've witnessed this moment of sort of regional recognition over and over again over the years. There are few places on Earth where the collision of informality, militarization, environmental vulnerability, and the dramatic proximity of wealth and poverty can be so vividly experienced. But in reality, the conflicts that we experience here locally between nation and nature are reproduced again and again across the entire continental border between the United States and Mexico. Over the years, we've collected aerial photos like these that document precise moments where the jurisdictional line collides with natural systems, powerfully illustrating what dumb sovereignty, 19th century sovereignty, looks like when it hits the ground in a complex bioregion like this. Our Mexus project, Mexus, then imagines what this continental border zone becomes without the line. Mexus dissolves the border into a bioregion whose shape is defined by the eight binational watershed systems that are bisected by the wall. Mexus also exposes other systems and flows across this bioregional territory. Tribal nations, protected lands, croplands, urban crossings, many more informal ones, 15 million people and more. Ultimately, Mexus counters America's wall-building fantasies with more expansive imaginaries of belonging and cooperation beyond the nation state. Here it is in 2018 at the Venice Architecture Biennale. Now the final civic stretch literally, and the end of our talk, is a visualization project we call the political equator, right? Which traces an imaginary line across the globe from San Diego, Tijuana, forming a corridor of global conflict between the 30th and 38th parallels north. Along this trajectory lie some of the world's most violent and contested thresholds. Again, the US-Mexico border at San Diego and Tijuana, the most trafficked international checkpoint in the Western Hemisphere, the Strait of Gibraltar and the Mediterranean, the main routes from North Africa into fortress Europe, the Israeli-Palestinian border, a cauldron of burning injustice that has exploded once again in the most horrific way. India-Kashmir, a site of enduring territorial conflict 
since British partition, the border between North and South Korea, representing decades of intractable Cold War conflict. And you can't see it here, China's accelerating militarization of the South China Sea, along with Taiwan and Hong Kong. That's quite a set. Now, visualizing this political equator in red, alongside the climatic equator below in green, was an astonishing discovery for us because the ribbon in between them, give or take a few degrees, contains our planet's most populous slums, its sites of greatest natural resource extraction and export, and its zones of greatest political instability, climate vulnerability, and human displacement. And when these parallel equators are applied to the Pierce Quincuncial projection from above, the Arctic is centered with its melting ice caps detonating, sea level rise, dramatic coastal vulnerability, and again, human displacement. In the end, the collision of nationalism and border building, climate catastrophe, and the dramatic displacement of peoples is sort of like the global injustice trifecta of our time. But as we said at the beginning, and there's hope in this, these dynamics always hit the ground somewhere and are experienced every day by people locally in places like ours and right here you know, as well in places like yours. Thank you, thank you. We'll leave this in each other. I'm going to leave the political. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think uh, you, for now, you want to sit in the. Yeah, I don't I know how long it took. Uh, we took, but uh, I'm not sure. I think should we sit in these two? Uh, seven. Okay. Did you want? I think he wanted you here. Anyway, I think oh. he numbered them somehow, but it's okay. Oh. Do you have another? Tell pen? me. Do you have pens? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank That's you. Great. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Okay. Well, this is wonderful. Really, I, I, I have to start by thank you both, but I'd like to thank you very much, Roy, for give me this opportunity to be here. No, I, 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 there is one thing that for me, uh, this is very special. <clears throat> well, first I'd like to mention uh, from now it's impossible to see you both uh, separately. You know? <laughs> I mean, it's uh, yeah. such a, a meeting, like in, an encounter really. Uh, but I, what I'd like to ask to you and and also your permission you know, to share with everyone and uh, like a way to say why to me this is so special. I, I met Ted Cruz in 2002 in Mexico and then you brought me by the first time to US. Yeah. <clears throat> I can't say that he's my English professor because <laughs> I, I, I don't want to ruin your reputation in here and these people, they know me. But uh, he's uh, the person uh, responsible for make me try to learn this language. You know? When he invited me to lecture in San Diego and LA in 2003 and I accepted, but then that he told me, but you have to speak in English, and that was completely impossible for me, but, uh, and, and uh, you were so special, you know, on my side all the time. And, but then I went uh, with you to Tijuana. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you used to go, I think, that every week or almost to a place that you used to call the church. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the church at Armando <laughs> <laughs> the church, yes. It's yes. a bar that was really fantastic, isn't it? And <clears throat> so you, you, 
somehow, you know, you changed my life. I mean, there, there is, uh, uh, even uh, to receive you here today, you are responsible for that, like 21 years ago, you no? Know? I, 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 this is why it's so special to me to be here. But there is one more thing. No, I went there in 2003. I'm from Brazil, from a country in which uh, this social problem has a very strong impact in my, my life, in my... And, and then we went to Tijuana, and, and I, I could see what was in your focus at that time. No, and, and how you, you, as an architect, you were with your attention to all those issues that, in general, are completely dismissed. Uh, <clears throat> so, and this is, uh, and, and after that, well, we saw like a wave in which uh, like uh, favelas for, was like in every school. And, and then that wave uh, passed somehow. But what I saw today, and uh, it's a shame I was not following that much as I should your, your work, but it's amazing because uh, it's a monumental construction what you did together, no? I mean, uh, and <clears throat> what you, you presented here, no? And, and, and uh, since that time, I could see that <clears throat> you're not like trying to find uh, like uh, opportunistically, like uh, an issue to but you are really and profoundly engaged you know, with this problem. So it was true, your interest and your engagement. And this makes a lot of difference, you no, know, and along of the term. And that's why you, uh, you could be so persistent in it. Mm -hmm. So, and then when Roy made me this uh, invitation, uh, it's so, interesting because what I th also think it's a perfect encounter that uh, an architect and a political science like uh, as a, but how complementary is the, the, the approach. And sometimes they'll reading like at the exhibition at MoMA in 2023, I, I, I could see some of the answers you did. Mm. And <clears throat> that could be like, uh, a question, but I'd like to listen a little bit more because sometimes uh, reading the, the answer, I could say you are the architect and he is the <laughs> <laughs> political uh, scientist. You no, know? because like one thing that to me is very and and my perception is from this, I, I completely dedicate to design building this, but like. <clears throat> When you mention one thing, uh, that when people are in a very vulnerable situation and they, they can count with anything, uh, everything that they, they have that they can use is suitable to be used as construction material, you know, like you showed, you no know, mm -hmm. tires and everything. So, uh, and, and this is, uh, I think, that for design, this is a kind of freedom that we should learn. I think that we should learn with this freedom. And, 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 and when you, this is very political to me when you said about the immigrant, no, but uh, how much they, they can uh, be free to, to arrange with what they have as resources to make their life possible. So what to me is very remarkable, these are two things that I could ask, but what is very remarkable about the presentation today, <clears throat> and you were just mentioned, know, that this, the, the universe where you are, there is no architecture school. And, and uh, so you're, showing us one thing that is la, like a global shame about <laughs> humanity. 
<clears throat> in my country, this is a very sensitive issue, but it, it is in the whole world. Uh, <clears throat> And, and I feel you know, that we are in a time nowadays that is very, <clears throat> it's just about the nouns, accusation, like if this was enough. Uh, and you are completely dedicated to find how to face the problem mm -hmm. and to, to show us what are some keys to overcome this moment. So, I, I uh, know this is, is what is very, uh, has a very important uh, value for architecture. So you found a place to architecture, or you showed us that architecture has still a meaning, you know, and, and uh, is still required to formulate the answer, like you, you, you showed us in several example, no, the community stations is, is amazing. I mean, the material are new, the shapes are new, the providers are, and, and the result is, or this idea that the house is not just a house, that the house doesn't finish at the, the threshold, no, on the door, but the, the, it's just, uh, uh, it is activated by the community life. So these are our lessons that I think that for architecture means the hope. Mm -hmm. So what I'd like to do is to close this door and to keep you at the school <laughs> forever. <laughs> but I, I, I would like to mention this to thank you again for the lecture. But I'm, uh, what I, I think that's important to do is to open for questions in the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Angelo. Thank you for those, that response. Beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. We have much to say to, <laughs> to respond to you, but we'll do it in, in, in the course of responding. Yeah. Hi. Yes, uh, th thank you very much for the lecture. Um, I have to admit from the beginning, I don't come from architecture, but I'm a philosopher, so I'm like um, <laughs> asking maybe a little bit different questions. Um, I just wanted to mentioned two points. I really like your work and I really think this is a very amazing way to not only combine um, different, a different approach to architecture but also to uh, combining theory and practice and I think this is uh, something we really really need in university work. And um, I have two questions. The one thing is um, you had one slide um, with a part from your book um, about rethinking ownership. And I just wanted to know more about uh, what you mean by this, especially with your understanding of justice. Because justice, of course, plays a huge role. The concept plays a huge role in your um, work. And I want, wanted to know more about how you would say, like, uh, to rethink ownership would also mean to um, uh, make a distinction between, uh, to, to develop a concept of justice that sets apart from ownership. Um, and ha how much this also get in, gets into, like, a direction of um, questioning capitalism, for example. Mm -hmm. I think this is really, really important because, of course, are, like you are operating in inside a capitalist system. But, of course, your work goes very much beyond this. And I just want to know how you deal with this like um, problem of like having a strong concept of spatial justice that's, that, in principle, if everyone would apply it, we had to step out of capitalism. And I think this is a very important, like I would know, want to know more about how you mm. think about this. And the second question is, um, you had, I, I really like your, your, you had this brief, brief um, discussion of that you don't understand form or the formal as uh, an aesthetic um, category alone, but as a practice. And I really like this, and I think this is, um, uh, I, I'm, I have a focus in, in aesthetic theory, so I'm, uh, I think it's possible to combine these kind of things, especially when it comes to like the aesthetic qualities of your work, which are, I think, a lot. Um, but I just wondered how you deal with um, formalizing having the inherent problem of reducing complexity. And I think this is something that is like formal 
um, to formalize things has to do with like reducing complexity. And I think this is a very important like question, especially when it comes to this map, because of course, I totally get the political equator here, but of course, yeah, like, if you are talking about like um, regions of climate vulnerability, if you are talking about um, the uh, people of Australia battling with uh, bushfires or the people of Alaska and um, Can Canada dealing with like um, uh, the, the, the um, warming and especially in Siberia and the northern part of Russia too. So I just was wondering if, of course, you could like mm. expand this equator around the sure, whole globe. Yeah, yeah. So I was just wondering how you deal with the, the, the problem. I think we all have to face that formalizing also have like a tendency to mm. see only one direction. So, yes. Yeah, wow. Well. Do you want to take the second first, and I'll take the capitalism? I'll, I'll, or I'll, I'll, I would like to do a cross-section, but if you want to begin... Why don't you begin, and I'll, I'll riff off of you. Yeah, uh, we know at the center of the work, and I, I, I know that we were maybe moving fast, but to the first part of the question about ownership, um, obviously our commitment is really to challenge the hegemony of neoliberal political and economic forces. At the same time, we don't want to be naive in suggesting that urban transformation, as we all from the left would like to idealize at some point, will arrive in two months. The question that we ask ourselves is, when is that more structural, social, and urban transformation will happen? What do we do in the meantime? And for us, it's been essential to penetrate the logics of economic development, to understand the intelligence of developers in manipulating time and resources without investing that much while gaining huge um, uh, uh, revenue and profit. That became an equation for us that was very important. But ownership in this case, uh, or through the lens of urban and social justice, as you, as you mentioned, has to do first with thinking of engaging a process by which we advocate the redistribution of resources. Obviously, through our project, also, that implies knowledges, how to empower all of us to really understand what, how we can really become developers, in a sense, uh, of our own housing and our own uh, public spaces, as we mentioned. Um, for us, it was important because a lot of what we talk about from the vantage point of academia remains hugely sconced in a symbolic agenda. In fact, I've been hearing, and all of us do it, acknowledging, land acknowledgments to finally after all this time, uh, be clear about the fact that we have colonized, that we have really, this, we are standing on the land that was and continues to be through that mythology or, you know, indigenous. But often I become dissatisfied about just that statement, even though we must say it. We must say it because it, it begins with an acknowledgement. But in our mind was this provocation to ourselves. That is hugely symbolic. To be hugely operative, we must have to really redirect resources to those communities that suffer those decades of disinvestment, marginalization, and exclusion, so that they can be in charge to manage their own modes of productivity. They must become the developers of their own housing and their own revenue. Without doing that, I think we're just perpetuating a project that remains hugely distant. So ownership, for all, rethinking ownership means rethinking uh, the capabilities of communities to really uh, operationalize their, their own skills, their own you know, um, agenda. So in that sense, it's, it's, that's the idealization of what opened up our projects to say to our public university, hey, you occupy this land. Let us leverage your economic power so that our partners can become developers of their own housing our chancellor was worried from the beginning, and then he understood that the university was not going to own those places, but the community was it's always about liability. Anyway, through that also, it's about the fact that architects must become now more than ever interlocutors of institutional memory, because this is not that distant from the New Deal, where, in fact, other forms of ownership in terms of housing uh, were enabled, but we forgot about them. Land trusts, community trusts, cooperatives, all of that is still ensconced in the legislature, but it needs to be resurrected. So that's what I'm trying to, we're trying to say. To redefine ownership is to challenge the hegemony of privatization that has exerted a huge havoc 
And it, 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 it presented a violent blow to those collective social and economic resources. I just read an, an article in the New York Times about how New York is rethinking its housing because of the emergency, and all what they are doing is incentivizing developers while maybe addressing issues of low rent and rent control. But we would like housing to be brought back to progressive governance. Uh, and in, in so doing also a new model of progressive uh, bureaucracy that includes communities as the co-developers of their own housing. That's what I meant, uh, we meant by redefining ownership. I wanted to cut the second one had to do with, uh, remind me very quickly, the second, Inform the informality. Through that, maybe advantage can be brought up because we find in the idea, well, we said it, it's a double project. We said it uh, in, in, in the suburbia where we live. We want to inject projects and agendas and most of development that pixelate the large with the small, that problematize and that really, you know, that's the reason the migrant neighborhoods where we've been working became our laboratories because we realized that those neighborhoods began as homogeneous environments of mono-use parcels and top-down planning agendas, but through time as migrants arrived, they began to transform those spaces, transforming those neighborhoods into more complex environments. So in, the, in San Diego, we're trying to, we said, informalize the formal just a bit, like we said, because it's, it's, it, we, we want to maintain ourselves pragmatic. We're not going to transform these environments from one day to another. But now in Tijuana, the informal is already thriving with that complexity. But it needs organization. It needs frameworks to really clarify, visualize, and enable other ways of scaling up. So that's the reason we said there is the opposite. We formalize the informal just a bit, providing frameworks and organizational practices and so on. And finally, there was the issue, and, and by the way, that became a, a DNA for thinking of, of the informal not as just an aesthetic practice. That was your last question. Because in reality, we were tired uh, to hear and to think that what we were doing or the vantage point from architects and all this was just to really talk about the quirkiness and the kind of romantic bricolage and the kind of incrementality, which still is very important as a concept. So we were not saying, no, we don't want to imitate that. What we want to learn is the procedural dimension of the informal. We can extract from it. We can extrapolate. And we, architects, become the political representatives of such set of strategies to knock on the doors of institutions and suggest other ways of layering the, 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 the official city through incrementality and through adjustment and adaptation. So it's a, an, an act of translation that, that needs to occur uh, at that point. Yeah, and just, just to add, and maybe to just frame it slightly differently as a, as a fellow humanist, social scientist, I was trained as a historian of philosophy, so I, I, I appreciated your question and the way it began as this sort of attempt to, to bridge theory and practice in new ways given proximities and so forth. And I, I guess I would say what we're attempting to do is chasten what we see as inadequate theorization about these processes through very practical ethnographic kind of work in the places. You know, what we're trying to do is to provide a more accurate description of the processes through which people who are facing these vulnerabilities every day are navigating, um, are navigating their challenges. And so I think the whole debate about urban development changes when there's recognition that these communities are incredibly resilient. Um, so you, you break out of a conventional public-private model or a conventional sort of social service model when you attempt to provide a kind of dignified response to how these communities are actually engaging their own their own their own challenges, I, and, and I think that the, the the question about informality is very much the same. We just got tired of the fetishization of the aesthetic object um, to really you know enter the process to understand the ingenious political economy of the movement and the tra the transgression of this border with materials. I mean, it's a beautiful, you know, political economy of 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 waste and reuse um, that was was missing. So, 
What can we do regionally to help scale up these processes that are actually a part of the resilience of these communities rather than thinking de novo about how to respond you know, to arriving migrants and so forth? Um, so you know, we've always seen ourselves and our practice as a kind of um, a practice of mediating between responses that are too often theory driven um, through a more, um, a, a richer engagement with practice, right? Oh. What is your name, sorry? You just let me talk. I have to, I'm a German, so I have like this. Okay, you have many. <laughs> anyway, but thank you. Those thank questions you. were so Beautiful amazing. Questions. And thank you for letting us then elaborate on some of the issues. But now I, I remember something, the political equator, it is true. Often we get in trouble because we're not suggesting this to be just this binary system or this site specific. For us, the political equator became a point of entry. The rise, the rise zone. And understanding that really the sites of conflicts are somatically distributed throughout the world. But, but there was something dramatic, mainly because we also have been tired of this, okay, the, the, the first and the third world, you know, they are old notions. But we said, well, wait a minute. I mean, we still are experiencing hemispheric inequalities, and, and our research had to do with the transferences or flows across those. Uh, but yes, it is a distributed system, and in fact, many of the friends that throughout time we've built in terms of practices are play, people who are working in those sites of conflict. Um, uh, the idea that urban and global conflict becomes an operative tool for the practice to really visualize it, uh, and so on became, became important. And in that sense also, finally, sorry, it's just that your question is very wonderful, uh, is about talking to the enemy, uh, meaning uh, we were tired of just preaching to the choir, in a sense, and because uh, a lot of our activist friends were horrified when we went to knock on the doors of the maquiladoras, you know, in Tijuana. I said, well, wait a minute, we need to make institutions accountable. You know, just because this creativity happens here, that does, doesn't mean that we will leave institutions off the hook. So we are constantly negotiating access to uh, rechanneling or redirecting uh, urban problems. And you know, another thing that people don't realize, and you see this a lot in border zones, is, for example, in the US, the, the conservative business community in San Diego, Tijuana looks very, very different than the conservative sort of business community in the, or the rest of the United States because, you know, and we find this all the time, you know, uh, the business community in San Diego hates the border wall as much as the human rights community does because it prevents the free flow of goods and services, right? So they have these imaginaries of economic development across the region that are that are blocked by this political border. So sometimes we find ourselves actually on the same side of the table as people who are friends would be like revolted that we're working with, but why not, right? If we can figure out how to get things done together, um, we will. So it's a, it, the border zones, so we're trying to provide, a more, again, a more authentic description of how life actually goes on in this region. There was a question yeah. over here. Yes, two more. Yeah, okay. Hi, um, so I wanted to ask a question about, um, you've mentioned a couple of times like the role you think architects have to play in this sort of endeavor, but what do you think it'll take for sort of co-production to become a default part of the architectural process? Because I think that's still very much not the case, particularly in the way it's taught. So how, I, I know you've done work at UCSD, but how do you wish that architects would, would approach this differently? You know, so you know, we we sometimes do studios at architecture schools, and we kind of observe on you know how this kind of work is being taught or integrated into studios, and we're actually a little bit wary about it because this is really, really, um, it's very intense work that takes long cultivation of trust with communities. So every school now wants to send their students out into the field and do studios that are field-based. And it becomes um, a drain often and a burden on community agencies that have to absorb all of our academic enthusiasm. <laughs> so, but yet, how do you train students without providing hands-on skills for doing this? This is actually one of the reasons why we set up the community stations to begin with, because 
we wanted to create an infrastructure of existing trust in the community so that the university wouldn't be a burden on communities when we would facilitate the arrival of students and, and do. Um, and we made sure that our community partners are really well paid for this. And our funders get this. Our funders get this and they support it. So, you know, so we have this infrastructure in place. We really have been arguing that architecture schools everywhere should be doing this and developing long-term relationships with community organizations that are, are respected and paid for their time and their resources and their networks and their social capital and everything. Um, and develop projects together long term. So, so since we've been working in these communities now for 15, 20 years, we're actually able to see the long term impact of doing this work together. And students can see their role in those processes over time. So I mean, I think it's, it's, it, it requires a change in the way architecture schools and design schools see their relationship to communities mm -hmm. in a less extractive, one-off sort of way in and in, in a longer organic um, partnership uh, uh, between the university and the community. A lot of the um, project of the community stations, which we were very lucky to get support from a variety of foundations, obviously, and to really be the seed for starting these projects that now will hopefully generate revenue to the communities that are our partners, that initially we proposed to them that this relationship between university and communities, uh, which went, again, in, involved tilting the vertical to a more horizontal uh, co-production. In this case, we specialists, right? We have knowledge. And, and by the way, parenthesis, um, we are very critical of advocacy planning, who has made architects into this. You know, go to communities. you shut up, right, and you hear what communities want, and you go and just draw what the community wants. But we realized that that encounter needed to really be curated better, because it really had to do with the meeting of different knowledges that needed to coalesce, needed to interpenetrate. We have knowledge as architects, and communities, not that they have knowledge in terms of architecture, but they have knowledge of everyday practices, uh, of, 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 of solidaristic everyday dynamics of that can be supported by space. So we want to demystify. We are not community designers in that sense. That, and that's the reason we are critical of advocacy planning, because it has disincentivized the voice and the imagination that uh, architects and communities can co-produce. So it's difficult to suggest it, but a lot of what we presented to many of uh, the, well, the foundations that supported us was that there was a role that was missing in that relationship, and that was an urban curator uh, that is part of our team that calibrates the circulations between students and the communities. In other words, we're investing in management and coordination of these programs with our nonprofit partners who don't, don't have the capacity or, or the, 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 the economy to support us. So, and, and they are the ones also that through our own pedagogical experiments, allow the circulation of the, 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 the specialized knowledge of the university to come into communities, but also the creative intelligence of uh, communities to enter the university. So we actually give a stipendia and fellowships to activists to come and co-teach with us. And the moment an activist comes and puts on the table a brief that completely challenges and ruptures our own assumptions, that's the moment when other things, other advantages, other directions begin to emerge. So I would say, yes, universities need a lot more in producing those bridges of trust. And that circulation needs to be a curatorial project. I mean, what we've seen firsthand is how skeptical, and maybe you know, some of you who do community-based work see how skeptical universities, uh, communities have become of universities. They don't get. Like, wait, somebody was just here last week. Is that you? Or, there's confusion. There's very little coordination on the campus. And then, you know, it's like the public health model. The university comes in, does all sorts of like evaluation and testing, and they discover, oh, guess what? Your community has higher rates of emphysema than anybody else in the region. See ya. You know, like, and all of this like anxiety is stirred, and there's no there's no follow up. There's no engagement yeah. to actually figure out how to. How to, how to resolve the issue. So. It, it is a masochistic practice, to tell the, to the truth. It's taken yeah. a long time. We were stubborn to say that we wanted to operate outside the 
client architect relation. And that at that point, we were going to also be in charge of the financialization of the projects and, um, and, and establishing those, those, those even, you know, linking special design with protocols, with, with programmatic frameworks that would make those spaces inclusive and sustainable in the long term. Therefore, we convinced our university, if we're going to do this, we're going to establish co social contracts with our partners. We are going to be there in the long haul. So it's a very embedded practice. That's another thing, too, which I imagine places like MIT could really generate with the communities and, and, and nonprofit sector that surrounds it uh, to create a more long-term, sustainable. That's the Morningside uh, uh, yeah, Academy. Yeah, is all so about. thank yeah. you for the question. Yeah. Happy. Yes. Rafi. Yeah. Oh, uh, so so great! So much of what you're saying resonates uh, perfectly, uh, and one of the beauties is, you know, your holistic thinking, top down, bottom up. You know, the research and the practice component. Uh, uh, you know, embracing design at a time when social activism, right, is associated with anti-design, right? So. And I, this is, I mean, you're, you're doing so many things, right? You're educators, you're researchers, you're community organizers, you're activists, you're policy makers, you're designers, you're urbanists, you're developers. You know, how, how do you present yourself? <laughs> and, and where do you think is your most significant contribution? Wow. Well, you know, so the university likes really tidy categories, and so our colleagues don't know what to make of us. And I've, in this, I can just speak for the social sciences. Like, I've had colleagues tell me, we don't know how to evaluate your work, so, you know, we're just going to take our hands off the way. So, so it's a problem when universities are so sort of siloed and disciplinary, and, and, and graduate students are oftentimes scared away from working with us because they're advised that nobody will know how to categorize their work for, for, for the reason that you, that you. But w we've been very fortunate that we've been able to set up a center on the campus that really isn't beholden to any dean or department chair where we can do the kind of agile interdisciplinary work that we do. So we've found a kind of refuge for ourselves on the campus with our own design studio and, and so on. And sometimes people refer to it as the Fauna and Teddy show. And they say that in a derogatory way. That's not a positive Our colleagues thing in campus. Our colleagues on campus, yeah. Um, um, but, you know, so, you know, we've worked in a variety of institutions. So for a while, we were running like a civic innovation lab inside the city. And we work a lot in organizations, you know, nonprofits. We've actually found the university to be um, probably the most congenial space for the kind of work that we do, especially since we're able to control our own resources and we have our own administrative staff. I mean, imagine how difficult it is from the base of a public research university to get this level of capital funding across an international border. I mean, it's really, really hard. So we have to have very agile administrators who can help us figure out how to do this kind of work. But it really gets back to something I think that Angelo said at the beginning, the kind of cross-fertilization of the disciplines. I mean, I'm always astonished in the social sciences that we talk about these abstract concepts like justice and equity, right? And we have no sense of the space in which these things actually happen. There's no spatial recognition at all about where democracy takes place. And we talk about it in these sort of abstractions. And so I've been trying to sort of spatialize what the social sciences are talking about. And, and equally, Teddy, in the design world, at least on our university, is trying to smuggle in social and political concepts to situate what are often abstract and aesthetic conversations. So we're, you know, we're, we're trying to sort of, we're trying to break down our, our, our fields. We've both been critics within our, our fields, I think, um, for, for decades. Um, so finding each other was just like finding a, a fellow. Um, it's great because it. we, we're not only partners in the world, but we are partners in life, and that really is just a luxury. Um, but I, I should say, you know, it's, thank you for the question, Rafi. In, in, in reality, it's difficult to, like, you know, one thing, obviously, uh, 
But you know, I mean, we've been, you know, many of us, you know, trying to make sense of our own practices. I mean, in, in my case, in our case, I think the main satisfaction, I don't know if the question was about, well, where to locate our own uh, desires or, or, you know, a sense of, I don't want to say accomplishment or something, but the, the thing is that there is something interesting about having shaped a, a particular practice. A, a, and we always say that to students, you know, like uh, the world is burning, of course, and, and more a, a different practices need to emerge. You know, maybe you can work in the first months to repay your loans, whatever, but the point is that all of us could potentially frame a, 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 a process of action. I mean, this notion that the political is a moment of discerning, you know, in these sort of different roads, what position you need to take. Um, and so I think that it, that's the reason I said we are hugely masochistic, because it really took a long time. We took a detour. I mean, obviously, as an architect, I, I aspire to build the spaces. Uh, but to get there, it took a long time. Um, and, and, and in that sense, it's expanding, obviously, the field of design. I mean, we're in, super interested ourselves in designing protocols and rights and um, you know, the programmatic architectures uh, um, and so on. So, but you know, many friends 15 years ago, whatever, you know, say, you know when are you going to build, right? And so well, we're building a position, you know? And, and it, it's really, it's, it, it feels that finally, after all these years, the, the dots that were sort of, you know, began to coalesce. Uh, and in that sense, I think maybe one main sort of, I don't know what to call it, you know, why not to say it? We, we have been super excited and, and proud, potentially, that war is weird, but that we've been able to really um, become a, a interlocutors. And, and that's the reason I think that top-down, bottom-up that you picked up is so essential, because there are not too many practices that really mediate. All uh, many activists, friends of ours, who are working with the bottom up, from which our practice emerged for many years, abhor the top down. Uh, and the top down needs to be made accountable, and sometimes it disengages uh, the bottom up. And for us, it's, there, there need to be more practices that intervene in the interface and, and, and become traffickers of the intelligence from below to knock on the doors to return the resource, you know, these things. So I think that having found a particular uh, model of co-development, redirecting the resources of the university, engaging those bridges of trust, I mean, those projects, you know, the San Isidro project became, he said, I hate to say it, but it was a $9 million development package that we curated. And now the community owns that project, you know, and, and, the, and the revenues, and, and we committed for the, in perpetuity, to activate those spaces with the theater department, with the dance department, you know, to, to come and work with youth. And so, um, so yeah, so maybe the urban curatorial dimension. I think that that's maybe something that really make, make, makes us proud because institutions are fragmented and we more and more need people that really connect the dots and, and produce new cross-sectorial synergies. And finally, by the way, my own desires, if I could, I mean, I'm, I'm a, a closeted painter. That's what I mean. It's like, I, 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 I think that if everything, I don't know, falls apart, I would just retreat and maybe re-engage, uh, uh, you know. But uh, the practice that we've been able to assemble really began to make sense after all these years. <laughs> I shouldn't have it. <laughs> So thank you everyone for coming. Uh, thank you, Teddy. Thank you, Fona, uh, for a splendid lecture. Actually, thank you. very glad that you recognize the complexity of the scene and uh, the almost like masochistic dimension <laughs> that engaging in some of the things that you're doing has, uh, because yeah, we can perfectly see the complexities, but also how rewarding it must have been like to work over all these years and actually come up with these amazing results. Angelo, thanks a lot for moderating the conversation and opening up the discussion. And well, thanks all of you for coming. We have a lecture next week. We're going to have uh, Anne Lacaton, uh, 